This is part two of our series of lectures on section 5.1b, in which we talk about finite sets. In this lecture, I'm going to quote several theorems for you concerning finite sets, theorems about unions, subsets, differences, and Cartesian products of finite sets. If you give yourself a finite number of sets, each of which is finite, you can create new sets by using these various set operations that I've indicated here. So the kind of thing you'd like to know is, if you start with finite sets and you do some of these operations on it, um, do you still get finite sets, and what can you say about their cardinalities? So these are the operations that we're going to consider. We're going to do unions of finite sets, subsets of finite sets, take differences, set theoretic differences of finite sets, and we're going to talk about Cartesian products of finite sets. What can you say about their uh, are they still finite, and what can you say about their cardinalities? So first let's talk about finite unions of sets, each of which are finite. So in this theorem we begin with two sets, each of which is finite, and we're going to make the assumption that they are disjoint. So if you give yourself two disjoint sets, they have nothing in common, each of them is finite. When you take their union, what can you say? So intuitively, the union is obtained by just throwing in one big box all of the elements of A and the elements of B. And uh, since there's no overlap, then it uh, feels like we're just going to get how many elements out of it. Well, the uh, number of elements will be the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. And so that's, that's what this theorem is saying. It's saying that the union will still be finite and the cardinality of the resulting set will be the sum of the two cardinalities. I think that's really completely intuitively obvious, and uh, it is true. Now this time, instead of just giving yourself two sets, suppose you give yourself more than two sets, or I should say any number, any finite number of sets. It could be one set, it could be two sets, it could be a hundred sets. We're going to assume that they're all pairwise disjoint, which means if you take any two of them together, they have no elements in common. Then what can you say about the union of all of those sets? Well, it's the same kind of reasoning as we did up here. When you take the union, you're just throwing all of the elements in one big box, so it feels as if, since they're pairwise disjoint, it will not only be a finite set that you get, but the cardinality of the union will just be the sum of the cardinalities of the individual sets. So that's just as obvious as this one. Um, actually, the proof of this corollary, it really is a corollary, because the corollary is proved using induction, and the idea is that the uh, when you do the inductive step of giving yourself n plus 1 of these sets, the union of n plus 1 of these sets can be written as the union of the first n of them together with the n plus first. So the union of n plus 1 of them is really just a union of two sets namely the uh, first set being the union of the first n of them. And so then you just apply the inductive hypothesis to the union of the first n, and since you now have just a union of two sets, you can apply the theorem. So that's, that's why it's a corollary of the theorem. Well, I won't say any more about the proof right now. Now this is also a theorem about unions, um, but this time we're not assuming that the sets are... Um, a pair y, that we're not assuming that they're disjoint. So if you just give yourself a union of two sets, you can't expect the cardinality of the union to be the sum because the two sets may have some elements in common. So if you just simply add the cardinalities of the two sets separately, you may be double counting the elements that are in the intersection, and so you have to throw away one copy of the um, number of elements in the intersection. Okay, but that's the content of the theorem. If they're finite, then the union is always finite, and the cardinality of the union is the sum of the two cardinalities minus the cardinality of the intersection. This is the, an elementary case of what's called the um, principle of inclusion-exclusion. So that's all that I want to say about unions for now. Now let's talk about subsets of finite sets. This one really feels obvious. If you give yourself a finite set, finite non-empty set, and you give yourself a subset of it, then that subset must also be finite. So 
That surely feels really obvious. And here's another one that feels obvious. If you give yourself a finite set, and then you take a proper subset of it. So proper subset means it's a subset which isn't equal to the entire thing. Then it's impossible for the subset of a finite set to have the same cardinality as the cardinality of the entire set. In other words, it really gets strictly smaller in terms of its cardinality. So that would seem to be completely obvious, and it, and, and it is true. Remark, I've written it in red to uh, emphasize it, that the above theorem... This theorem here is false for infinite sets. It's very possible for an infinite set to have a proper subset which it's, which, uh, for which it has the same cardinality. In fact, we saw ex an example of that in an earlier lecture. If E denotes the set of even integers, then that is a proper subset of the set of all integers, and yet they have the same cardinality. Remember, we proved that um, a few lectures ago. So that's sort of typical for infinite sets, that uh, whenever you have an infinite set, it's always the case that there's a proper subset that has the same cardinality. Um, but that's definitely not the case for um, finite sets. Let's now talk about set-theoretic differences of finite sets. So give yourself a finite set, and then we'll give ourselves a subset of it then, of course, that set is finite. We just observed that on the previous slide. The set theoretic difference, A minus C, is also finite, because that's a subset of A. And the cardinality of A minus C is the difference of the two cardinalities. In other words, if you obtain this set by taking away some of the elements of that set, then the cardinality of what remains is the entire cardinality of the original set minus the cardinality of the subset that you removed. I think that, again, is intuitively completely obvious, um, but it can be proved, and it's, it's really a theorem. There really is something to prove there. And finally, let's talk about Cartesian products of uh, finite sets. Let's begin by looking at an example. If we take n sub 2, remember n sub 2 um, are the natural numbers 1 and 2, and n sub 3 are the natural numbers 1, 2, and 3. Now take the Cartesian product, take all the pairs, uh, one from here and one from here, and you'll get this set here. You get six elements. And therefore, this Cartesian product has the same car cardinality as n sub 6, because this has six elements in it. And therefore, the cardinality of n2 cross n3 is 2 times 3 is 6, which is the same as the product of the two cardinalities. That's one of the reasons that one uses product notation in order to refer to a Cartesian product. It's because the cardinalities multiply. Now that turns out to be true in general, and we have the following theorem. If m and n are any two natural numbers, then the theorem says that if you take the Cartesian product of n sub n uh, with n sub m, in other words, the Cartesian product of the integers from 1 up to n with the integers from 1 up to m, then that has the same um, cardinality as the set of natural numbers from 1 up to m times n. In other words, they both have cardinality m times n. And more generally, if a and b are any finite sets, they don't have to be these particular ones. They could be any finite sets, completely abstract. If you take the Cartesian product, the cardinalities multiply. So we're going to compare this theorem to a theorem we're going to see later involving infinite sets, and we're going to see that this theorem really fails dramatically when we deal with infinite sets.